actually feel like me and you can like I'm not like giving him any grace. At least he's giving me some.
the creator of the, the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be, be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is the God we are worshiping this morning. So let us stand and worship him with our whole heart and mind. be seated. A warm welcome to everyone, to our uh, first time visitors. If you haven't got a visitor slip, you can find one at the back um, at the door stewards. Uh, door stewards, they will ha gladly hand them out while we do this, is to connect with you um, so you can know more about us and us more about you. And a warm welcome to everyone else here. And uh, I see a few familiar faces I haven't seen for a while. Welcome. 
It's good to see you. And the Tempe's all the way from Richards Bay Calvary Baptist Church visiting us today. A warm welcome to you. Those here for the first time, our restrooms are on my right, your left. The cry room is also the entrance is on the outside on my right and your left. Why do we gather here this morning as God's people? Our focus of worship is not human experience. It's not a lecture. It's not entertainment. But it's all about Jesus Christ. His life, His death, and His resurrection. And especially this morning, as we are celebrating communion, we have a communion um, service this morning. So our songs are prepared around that. We will enter time, uh, when we enter our time of communion, there are two songs to prepare our hearts. So before we do that, let me open with prayer this morning. We are here alone to worship you, our Lord God. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. Our souls long and even yearn for the courts of the Lord. Our hearts and flesh sing for joy to the living God. How blessed are those who dwell in thy house. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. We would rather stand at the edge of your house than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For you, our Lord, our Lord God, is our sun and shield. Lord, you give grace, you give glory. No good thing do you withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. We pray that you would please shine your face upon us this morning and bless our worship time, our singing, our praying, and our sermon, our teaching from your word. And then later on, our Sunday seminary. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We will now share with you a pre-recorded bulletin. Please take note of um, the dates, upcoming dates, and then afterwards I will just highlight a few of them to bring them under your attention. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, as you've seen on the, on the bulletin, we have a ladies' fellowship coming up on the 28th of November. Or oh, no, on the, uh, there's another date. I didn't see when. <laughs> but you've got an RSVP before the 28th of November. So please do that with Shirley. Um, if you don't know how to contact her, um, just ask the door stewards or you didn't see the number. Um, we will gladly give you the details. And then um, we have our annual annual Thanksgiving service on the 5th of December. Please, as well as Chris uh, mention, mentioned on the last uh, previous Sunday, that um, we like you to join in on a testimony or a praise item. Also, please RSVP with him or Shirley, anything you like to share that day. Then on the 5th of December... We have our carol service on the same day as the Thanksgiving service, but in the afternoon, 4 p.m. As you've seen, we've planned uh, to do a picnic outside, and the service is also planned, Lord willing, if the weather holds, um, to do the service outside. So dress accordingly, and we will provide as much uh, umbrellas as we can, but bring your own, and uh, we're not sure if it will rain or not. But we ask God's blessing for, for that day. It's always a special time to, to um, praise our Lord in that time. And then to bring under your attention as well, our Sunday seminary after tea time, 10.30, it starts. As you can remember, Chris brought out the bell. So when you hear the bell, the Sunday seminary starts and we can join in. And it's been uh, such a blessed time of um, listening to ways of uh, personal productivity and uh, today Peter will share practical exercises for personal productivity uh, it's it's uh, such a blessing for us in today's time with being so distracted by social media our phones especially screen time and so much more um, to help us in that way so please join in later on and then a another um, not a request, just the encouragement for each and every one. We have printed gospel tracts, and it's at the back, at the door, or in the front as you come in. A gospel track of Jesus Christ. So please take one as you leave today. Um, I encourage you, I challenge you this week coming to share one at least. Um, share the gospel um, as you do your uh, work, uh, as you go out in, on your way to the shops. Um, let's go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ as we will celebrate communion today and be reminded for what he did for us um, in our lives. Next up is our corporate scripture reading from Genesis 40 verse 1 to 23. And here we continue the narrative of Joseph and where he reveals the dream of uh, the dreams in while he was in prison, where God helped him to reveal these dreams. I'm not sure if Kevin is here to read for us. Um, Kevin is not here. Joshua, thank you. Genesis 40, verse 1 through 23. From Genesis 40. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with the two officials. Excuse me. And Pharaoh was angry with the two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in their cu custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officer, officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? And they said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, 
Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossom, um, its blossom shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then jo Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In, the th in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. You shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly, as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so to get me out of this house, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in the pit. When the chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cakes, uh, cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days, and the three in three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, and he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Thank you, Josh for reading God's word. <coughs> Why do we sing praises to the Lord? Why do we sing hymns and songs? First of all, you'll say to glorify God. First answer that will come up. But as most of you know, the Israelites, they sang laments of songs of mourning in psalms songs of praise um, they sang to stir up their hearts to praise our lord when they went into battle when they had to face big obstacles trials they sang they sang psalms as we see in the new testament many times the psalms are quoted to encourage us, to build us up from God's word. And this is why we today sing unto the Lord, to stir our hearts up, to point our minds to him as we enter now the time of communion. These songs are saturated by the gospel, by God's word. The first one, you laid aside your majesty, gave up everything for me, for us. The second song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, the one who died for us. So please use these songs to reflect, to meditate upon Jesus, what he did for us, and what he, he is still doing for us. So please stand and worship our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And after that, we will have communion. Oh 
seated. So, what is communion about? As you just sang, it's all about Jesus, fundamentally. At its core, communion is a celebration, a remembrance, and proclamation of Christ's death. It reminds us and declares to those partaking that Christ was with us. Christ died for us. Christ is now working in us. And the last refrain there, and in hope of Christ returning one day. Isn't that wonderful? Luke 22 verse 14 through 20 reminds us and describes communion and its meaning. Yeah, communion was instituted for, instituted for the first time. I will read to us. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. What can we take out of this passage? Communion was initiated during the Jewish Passover celebration. Communion was a time of thanksgiving and blessing. Unleavened bread was broken, representing Christ's body. A cup of wine was shared together, representing Christ's blood. Communion is a symbol of the new covenant. So how do we here at Madrid Chapel celebrate communion together? We celebrate an open communion table for all believers who confess that Christ is their Lord and Savior and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Although we recommend that only baptized believers partake, but this we leave for your own conscience. But yet God warns us. He warns us in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So before I pray, and give thanks for the bread and the cup. Let us be quiet. Let us pray in our hearts as we enter this time where we, are, where we will commune together and partake together, confess our sins, examine our hearts unto the Lord. Let's be quiet. Yes, Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in humble adoration. It's you alone that can forgive sins. It's you alone that gives us a way to the Father. 
It's you alone who died on the cross for us, was resurrected, and who's coming again. Hallelujah. We come here in celebration of you, our Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our everything. We thank you for giving up everything, giving up your majesty for us wicked souls, for our wicked souls. We do not deserve what you have done for us on the cross. We could not have chosen it. We could not have wanted it. Thank you for putting it in our hearts to love you, to see you, to adore you, and to celebrate you. Lord, as we come celebrating the bread, your body being broken for us, in a most horrible, horrific way on the cross, your blood being poured out for us, covering each and every sin that we have committed. We can just say thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot say thank you enough, and we give you all glory. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. First Corinthians eleven twenty five through twenty six. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, "The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me." Amen. In our time of corporate prayer, we yet again have God's word to guide our prayers. Romans eleven thirty three through thirty six reads as follows Oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how he's inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let me pray.
we praise and glorify and thank a perfect God who gives us perfect gifts, who gives us His Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your perfect ways, your perfect timing, for who you are. We give you all the glory. Who are we to come and question you? Forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for knowing better. Give us a humble, a humble heart this morning. A humble heart unto your word, unto your spirit. Work mightily in us this morning as we come to you. Lord, forgive us our pride. We sin daily, we sin hourly, but we have the cross. You have provided. Thank you, Lord. We continue to pray for our members. We pray for Victor. We praise you, Lord, for his successful operation. We pray and thank you for sustaining him and his family. Lord, we pray that you would heal his body as he is in a process of recovering after the operation. We also pray that he would lead his family with your word and guide them to Christ, although facing these major health trials. Lord, we praise and thank you for Patricia. Lord, as she continually asks, um, searching for, for answers from the doctors, that you'll give the doctors and her wisdom in answering her health issues. Lord, we give you praise um, that Henry's operation went well and that the recovery is going well and that he will continue to recover well and be strong. We praise you for teaching him good lessons of patience in you, that your timing is perfect and your ways are right. Lord, we pray for Mike and Cynthia, Sarah <coughs> and Ethan. As Mike and Sarah have COVID, Lord, we pray for their protection and healing. Um, we pray for Cynthia's health as well as she is high risk, that you would protect her. And Lord, that they would trust you in this time and in this trial that you've given them. Be with the children as they write year-end exams that they won't be distracted and that Mike will lead them and lead them in a God-honoring way. Give him the strength to do this in this difficult time. Lord, we pray for those in our church that are struggling with these economic hardships of COVID and people losing their work and less income. Um, Lord, be with them. Grow their trust in them. Provide for them. You know each one's needs. And you know the struggles they face. Grow their trust and faith in you. We celebrate birthdays this week in our church. We celebrate Sinead Peterson, Justin Muller, Joseph Woolley, Kita Zulch, Joshua Harichand, and Anna Paula Francis. Lord, thank you that we can celebrate together, that we can upbuild each other, build each other up in a way of encouragement through your word. Lord, bless their day, grow them more and more in you, and uh, thank you for their witness in and love for you. We also celebrate anniversaries, Jed and Nat Natasha Creel, Mike and Cynthia, Chris and Megan. Uh, Lord, thank you for marriage. It's such a blessed way of a husband and wife being together. Your ways are perfect. Your ways are right. And I pray that you would bless these marriages as they have many years together and bless them and give them more years to come. 
and that you, our Lord Jesus Christ, will always be the center of their marriage. We pray for our solar five churches, Brackenhurst Bracken Baptist Church and Crystal Park. We pray for the shepherds uh, and their elders, Doug Van Meet at Brackenhurst and Mark Pen Penrith at Crystal Park, Lord, that you would bless their service this morning, that you would uh, bless your word this morning as they serve you faithfully every Sunday. Uh, protect them, grow their congregation, work in their hearts, those uh, members, and also they are um, having a lot of new visitors that you would encourage them and uh, help their integration processes as well. Lord, we pray for our offering. You are a God who gives abundantly more than what we deserve. And we give back just a little bit. Help us to do this sacrificially. Help us to do this joyfully unto you, Lord, to further your kingdom. I pray that you would bless the offering, that you would um, bless the, the wisdom of the leaders of Midrand Chapel in using the means and the money that you have provided, that it would be wise and uh, that it would that they would be good stewards unto you. And then, Lord, we, we ask your blessing upon our main service, in our ser main service, our, your word, the main dish, that your word would penetrate our hearts, your spirit will work mightily in us and um, open our eyes. Those who don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would, would do a mighty work this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we uh, have uh, our child care that can be dismissed. And as they are being dismissed to the house outside, we can stand and sing our last song, Speak, O Lord.
can be seated. Well, good morning from my side. Uh, again, just to um, encourage you with the Thanksgiving service on the first Sunday of December. If you have a testimony of something God has brought you through this year, trials He's brought you through, or you want to share about how God saved you, or you want to put together a PowerPoint presentation of a ministry you've been part of, let me have that this week, or let me know uh, that you would like to do that this week, and I'll build you into the service. The service is made up of contributions from ordinary members of our church, and um, so think about that, pray about that, if you could be a blessing to others by, by making a contribution. Um, it's thanking God for His faithfulness to us over the year. And then the carol service is really a, 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 a church service where we mainly sing Christmas, Christmas carols, um, and that's what it, re it is. It's a worship service, a singing service. And um, so it's an opportunity to invite friends and family uh, who maybe don't know the Lord, um, but they'd be willing to come to a service to sing about Christmas carols. And, um, and in that service, we'll also preach the gospel. And so that's another opportunity that you can use. And then just to remind you afterwards, if you're visiting, a special welcome. We'd like you to stay there. We can get to know you. And um, thank you for visiting us. And um, please do let us uh, get to know you. I say to the members every week just about, um, please go and find somebody you don't know and uh, make them feel welcome, greet them. I met a lady at our visitor's lunch last week who said she came to church and she heard me make this announcement and then they stayed afterwards and nobody greeted them. Everyone ignored them and pretended they weren't even there. Fortunately, I don't think that's the norm for us as a church, but I share that just to say it really makes a difference. You alone can make a difference just by noticing that couple or that person that's standing one side doesn't seem to have anyone they really know and going up to them and saying, welcome, this is my name, take them to somebody you do know. That can make the difference between someone never wanting to come back again. And some people come here, it's their last ditch effort at giving God a go in their life. They come broken and lost, and uh, we are the ones who need to tell them God cares. So do take that uh, responsibility um, seriously that each of you have. So we've been working our way through the letter to the Romans. Um, we're up to Romans chapter 10. So you can open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. It's a letter which gives a systematic presentation of the gospel, um, God's unfolding plan of redemption. And it's written to the church in Rome, not only to ground them in the gospel, that they could understand the gospel, but to really motivate them to be part of Paul's gospel mission, to take the gospel out to the regions belong he, uh, beyond. He wants Rome, and you see that in chapter 15, uh, to partner with him, this church, to partner with him in, in enabling the gospel to go to those who've never heard. And so it's helpful for us to think about that, that as we uh, encounter this gospel so clearly explained, it's not supposed to just inform our minds and make us go, oh, that's amazing. It's supposed to produce in us a personal response to Jesus Christ, a response that makes us love him and love the people that he loves, a response that would make us want to move out in proclaiming this gospel to those who don't know and haven't heard and haven't yet bowed the knee. That's what it's supposed to produce in us, and it's not, uh, we're not studying it rightly if it's not producing that response. And so I just want to stop at this point and give us all a chance to, to pray and ask God as we open His Word to do that work in our heart, to send His Spirit and convict us of this gospel and move us out in missions and evangelism um, with this gospel. So let's ask God to do that. Father, thank you for each one of your people that are gathered here this morning. 
my prayer is for those who don't know you, who have come this morning. Maybe they've been coming for weeks and months and years, but they don't truly know you. That you would open up their eyes and soften their hearts to lay hold of Jesus Christ. And for those who, of us who have known you, Father, forgive us for getting distracted by so many things. Forgive us for not loving Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. Forgive us for growing lukewarm in our passion for the gospel and to see your name proclaimed amongst all peoples. Forgive us for that as individuals. Forgive me for that. Taking my eye off what really matters. And forgive us as a church, Lord, for when we have lacked evangelistic zeal and a burden for the lost. And as we ask forgiveness, Lord, we thank you that we can open up your word this morning, which is living and active and pierces to dividing soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and we can be changed. And so, Father, we ask asking that you would send your spirit with power, and by your word, you would make us new, and you would renew our minds and our hearts, Lord, that we would stop, and we would turn to Jesus Christ and we would become his ambassadors and start living differently and thinking differently and feeling differently. Father, please focus your people this morning on Jesus Christ and this glorious message that we have in him. In his name and for his glory we ask it. Amen. So Romans chapter 10. Uh, in Romans chapter 9 to 11, Paul is addressing one of the major objections uh, to the gospel that he undoubtedly had heard many times as he went around proclaiming the gospel, and that is really what has happened to Israel. If, if Jesus is God's Messiah, if he's the Messiah given to the Jews and from the Jews, then why is it that so many Jews have not received him? Has God's plans and purposes for Israel failed? Has the power of the gospel proved powerless in their case? And Paul begins to answer this, and in his first part of his answer is found in Romans chapter 9, and his answer emphasizes God's sovereignty. And he really explains that God's plans and God's purposes and God's promises haven't been thwarted because they're never dependent on people. God has ordained everything that happened and, and it happens, and it's not contingent on man's will or man's desire. That's the first part of his answer. The second part of his answer is found in Romans chapter 10, and it emphasizes man's responsibility. The problem doesn't lie with God. The problem lies with man, and particularly with Israel, who has stubbornly rejected the gospel. The third part of his answer is found in Romans chapter 11, where he returns back to God's sovereignty and says, even in the current rejection, the large-scale rejection that Israel are having towards the gospel, God has a plan and a purpose. And his purposes are being worked out. And so he brings us full scale. The part we're looking at this morning is Romans chapter 10, which emphasizes human responsibility. God works out his plans and his purposes through the human will and the human uh, responsibilities that he's commanded us to do. God is sovereign, yes. And none of his plans and purposes can be thwarted. But people are responsible for their reaction to the gospel. God has chosen who will believe and respond to the gospel and be saved before the foundation of the world. Yes, that's Romans 9. But we are still responsible to preach the gospel and people are still responsible to believe it. And Paul doesn't explain how these two realities exactly fit together, God's sovereignty and human responsibility. He just presents both with equal clarity. Pray. Pray so earnestly and zealously, we saw at the start of Romans chapter 10, that people will be saved because it requires a supernatural work of God to save anyone. Without the intervention of God, no one will be saved. So pray as if only God can save because that is true. And yet preach and evangelize and convince and persuade and beseech people as if it was completely dependent on you. Because... Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, and that is also true. So that is our text this morning. I've entitled this message, The Beauty and Burden of Missions. 
Three essential means that God uses to save people. Three essential means that God uses to save people. Let's read Romans chapter 10. We'll pick up from verse 10 and then read through to the end of the chapter. Romans 10 verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they then call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. I asked, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I'll make you angry. And then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I've been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask of me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So if one means that God uses to save people the messenger, verses 14 and 15. Secondly, the message, verses 16 and 17. And then thirdly, the international mission, verses 18 to 21. So we'll take each in turn. Firstly, the messenger, verses 14 and 15. He's just been explaining in the preceding verses that everyone, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he raises the question, how are they going to call upon one in whom they've not believed? How are they going to believe if they've never heard? How are they going to hear unless someone preaches to them? How are they going to preach unless someone is sent? And he presents this sort of unbreakable chain that exists uh, that must be carried out, that we're responsible to do in order that people could hear and believe and be saved. And of course, he's presented another unbreakable chain just a chapter earlier in chapter 8. Uh, if you go back to ap- chapter 8, verse 28, Romans eight twenty-eight, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. The unbreakable chain of God's sovereignty began in eternity past. Those whom God foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And now he's taking one link out of that chain. Those whom he called. And he's expanding that link to say... How does God call people to himself? Those whom he's foreknown and chosen, those whom he's predestined for glory. How does he call them to himself? And he expands this into a bunch of uh, links that relate to our responsibility. God doesn't save people in a vacuum. He saves people through means. God has ordained not only that people are saved, but he's ordained how they're saved through the preaching of the gospel. So yeah, in Romans 10, there's another kind of chain. Because God has called people to himself and all nations to himself through hearing and believing the gospel, we have a responsibility then then to send out gospel messengers into all nations that all might hear and believe. This is the essential means, the cause and effect relationship by which God has ordained how he will call the elect to himself describe the links of human responsibility that fit within and make up the chain of divine sovereignty. This is how God is going to call people. And the emphasis is on the messenger, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. God has ordained and purposed that the gospel would be brought to his elect, his people, through messengers 
who bear the good news to them. That's how God undertook the mission himself. God the Son, didn't he? He took on human flesh. The word of God became flesh, as John 1 tells us, and dwelt among us. And he came bringing in himself, in his person, grace and truth in fullest measure. And that's why when God has now ordained that the message about what he's accomplished should be made known, it should be made known through personal messengers who are sent out to deliver the message in person. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. In verse 15, he's quoting from Isaiah 52, verse 7. It's a passage which speaks of God's great deliverance, and it, it pictures the messenger who brings the message about God's deliverance, as if the king has gone out and, and won a great victory on behalf of his people, and then he sends news back to his people about the, the victory that's been won. And the people are waiting anxiously to hear how has the king fared, and they, they, they see the runner coming along the mountains toward them, and they see his bearing good news of the king's victory. That's the picture here. The people wait anticipation, in anticipation and rejoice when at last they see the messenger bringing good news. So the idea here is that God has sent out authoritative messengers. He sent out those who represent him with the message of his victory. That's the idea. Ultimately, it's Christ who sends out the messengers because he's the king and it's his victory that we are telling people about. God has ordained that the gospel message be preached here, there, and everywhere. That was his plan all along, that it would be delivered through you and me in person. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are his ambassadors. Ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God has placed you in the midst of certain family members, friends, work colleagues, sports teammates. He's put you in a particular place at a particular time, and you will rub shoulders with particular people so that you could deliver in person the only message that could ever save them. That's what God has ordained for you to do, to be his ambassadors. This message isn't going to be received by all. You can see there in verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Notice there what it says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. The gospel is an authoritative message. It's not just nice information. It's not just a, a message about something I interesting that happened in history. It's the king of the universe making an appeal, an authoritative appeal through you. He sent you out as his messengers and you represent him and people are called to believe, to obey, to respond wholeheartedly to this message. It's an authoritative message delivered by us. Will you submit to the Lord and follow him or not? You are not done presenting the gospel until you've made an appeal. Will you repent and believe? That's the hardest part sometimes, isn't it? We can all talk about different facts and different opinions and we can throw different ideas around and say we've presented the gospel. You are not done until you say to them, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What is your response going to be? That's the appeal. God is making an appeal through us. In verse 16, he quotes from Isaiah 53, verse 1. You know Isaiah 53 is that famous passage that, that prefigured the crucifixion of Jesus, the suffering servant crucified, shed his blood for many, right, that they really didn't expect. He's quoting from this passage because people are going to struggle to believe in the Jesus that God has sent. 
People are going to struggle to believe in this suffering Messiah, this weak Messiah, this Messiah who came to deal with a much bigger problem than politics and sickness. He came to deal with the greatest problem of all, which is sin, and conquer sin and death. People are going to struggle with that. They're not going to believe in that kind of Messiah. Christ was not bringing good news of political deliverance that they wanted. He was not going to bring the healing to their land that they wanted. He wasn't coming in the kinds of powers and signs and wonders that they were expecting. You see, people want the deliverer, but they want a deliverer of a different kind. And that's what Paul's alluding to by quoting this. You understand that not everyone's going to obey this gospel. And he quotes from Isaiah 53. Even today, many people want to be saved, but not from their sin. They want a deliverer who will deliver them from their problems and from their burdens and from their anxieties and make their life richer and better. They want that kind of deliverer. But that's not the deliverer we're presenting. We're presenting Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for sin. Weak and crucified on a cross, but raised as the conqueror of sin and death. That's the deliverer we are presenting the message preached by many churches and christians is not the gospel and the faith that they're calling people to believe doesn't save there wouldn't be so many people calling themselves christians who know nothing of jesus christ and who live contrary to him if we were preaching this gospel whoever calls on the name of the lord will be saved Second, the message. The message. Then in verse 17, he says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. If we, believe, if we preach this message, you're a sinner, and you need to be saved from your sin, and there's no other way of salvation, and your main problem is sin, that message is not going to be well received. That message the world doesn't want to hear. But that's the message we're called to preach. So how will anyone respond to that message? How will they believe that kind of message that puts man down and makes man nothing and desperate and weak and doesn't offer to solve any of their problems? Well, God has packaged in this message his power unto salvation. It's the message itself that will produce the faith. That's the key verse in Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? Romans chapter 1, 16, what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it, it, the gospel, the message, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. For in it, in what? In the gospel message is the righteousness of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. How is it that people will believe it's if, we, if they hear this message about Jesus Christ, the message about Christ. Where does faith come from? It's by hearing the message about Christ. And so Jesus ordained an authoritative message to be carried by authoritative messengers and delivered intact, a simple message which bears the power of God unto salvation, which has the power to deliver people from death to life, from darkness to light, from sin to their Savior. And that's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to his language, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received and in which you st stand and by which you are saved, if you hold fast the, which I, uh, the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, you hear that? I delivered to you of first importance that which I also received. He's just passing on an authoritative message about Jesus Christ, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is the gospel message. Jesus died for our sin. Jesus buried, Jesus raised to life in victory. He didn't make this message up. He wasn't at liberty to change it or tweak it or alter it to make it more acceptable to people. He saw himself as just delivering it faithfully. He has the message. Take it or leave it. Like it or hate it. 
And that's why he could say in Galatians 1, I'm amazed, verse 6, that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Even though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. There is only one message that has the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel, pure and unadulterated, delivered faithfully by gospel messengers, whatever the response is going to be. That's your and my role. The gospel is like a key that unlocks eternity. But it has to be this key and this key alone that God has given us. We can't tweak a few edges here, you know, grind off a little edge here, take about this, this hard notch over here, take it out. What happens when you, when you do that to a key? It looks quite similar, doesn't it? It's a key, it's got a similar shape. You put it in the door and it doesn't work. It doesn't open men's hearts to Jesus Christ and save them. And so we need to be careful that we deliver this gospel message faithfully as God delivered it to us. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he said, because this is the power of God. Witnessing is primarily about sharing the gospel of what Jesus Christ has done, the good news. Jesus died, Jesus buried, died for us and buried and raised. That's it. Don't be tempted to change that. Don't be tempted to preach a gospel, Jesus died for your healing. Jesus died for your financial liberation. Jesus died for something else. Don't be tempted to, to preach another gospel, Jesus is not the Lord of the universe and the only Lord. And he calls on people everywhere to repent and believe. Just, you know, just give your heart to Jesus. doesn't matter if nothing changes. Don't be tempted to preach other messages. Don't be tempted to get distracted into discussions about how Noah fitted so many animals on the ark when we mainly call to speak about who Jesus Christ is and why he was crucified on a cross. Stick to the gospel and don't get distracted for all these other things. I mean, it's fine to have these conversations, but they've got to always come back to these simple gospel messages which are not hard to understand. They must just be believed. That's our job. This is the essential means by which God calls people to himself. Keep bringing them back. Look, I can't answer that question. But what I'm putting before you is Jesus Christ crucified. What are you going to do with him? Thirdly, the international mission. Verse 18, he says, But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. So he asked the question, but listen, in, in regard to Israel specifically, haven't they heard the gospel? And his answer is yes, they have heard the gospel. And then he quotes there um, in the second part of verse 18, their voice has gone out in all the earth. He quotes from Psalm 19.4. And he takes that psalm which talks about God's glory being like a message that is proclaimed in all of creation and no one can escape the message of creation about the power of God. And he applies that to the gospel as, as regards to Israel and says, you know what, the gospel has gone out so far and wide that that is as clear, ringing out as clear as creation, what Jesus Christ has done. So if they've heard, did they not understand? Is, is the problem that it wasn't explained very well to them. You know, maybe some of you sometimes think, you know, when people like reject the gospel, it's because you need more training in apologetics and you couldn't answer all their questions. Is, is the problem intellectual? It wasn't explained clear, clearly enough. And he says, no, again, he uses scripture to support his answer there. In verse 19, I asked, did Israel not understand? And then he quotes from Deuteronomy 32, from Moses, before Israel have even entered the promised land. And God says, you know what? I delivered you out of Egypt. I've revealed myself to you. But you're not going to believe in me and follow me. He tells them up front. 
And then Deuteronomy 32, 21, he says, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They've provoked me to anger with their idols. And so I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. He says, they have gone after other gods and made me jealous with their idolatry. Well, I'm going to make them jealous by going after other nations with my grace and mercy. That's basically what he says. Up front, he's, gonna, he's talking about the way he's going to show Israel their sin and rebellion for failing to believe in him. And then he quotes in verse 20, Isaiah 65, very much the same uh, flavor, Isaiah 65, 1. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek to me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation which did not call on my name. And that's because Israel was so rebellious and didn't believe in the Lord and follow him. There's two major points to get out of this quoting of these Old Testament texts. The one is this. If the Gentiles, who are not God's chosen people, could hear the gospel and believe it, Israel have no excuse. That's the first point. Israel can't turn around and say, oh, but we didn't understand, it wasn't presented clear enough. Secondly, Israel have been unfaithful to God from the beginning. It's not a new thing for them to reject His love and His truth. They've been doing that from the very beginning. God predicted from the very beginning. He can quote from these Old Testament passages to say, this has always been Israel's response to God. It's not that Israel haven't heard. It's not that they can't understand. It's that they won't understand. They refuse to submit, to obey, to believe in God's way of righteousness. That's what has been unfolding in the earlier part of the chapter. This is not an issue of knowledge or intellectual understanding. This is a moral issue. This is an issue of hardness of heart. This is so important that you get this. Because this principle is true of Israel. It's true of every unbeliever. Our problem when people reject the gospel is not intellectual. It's moral and spiritual. People are not going to be converted to the gospel by better conversations, better argumentation, and more information, more evidence. That alone is not going to convince them. People have a moral problem. They love their sin more than Jesus Christ. That's their problem. They love their idols more than the true God. That has always been the problem. Notice there in verse 21, All day long I've held my hands out to a what? A disobedient and contrary people. And the emphasis there is on willful rejection of which they're liable for. And yeah, we're back to where we began in Romans chapter 1, right? Though people know God, though people know the truth, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's because of the the love that we have for sin that we don't want to hear the truth and turn to it. We don't want to turn away from our sin. We don't want to respond to the call of Jesus Christ because we love our sin and our idols. That's Romans chapter 1. What is going to bring about repentance and faith? Well, one, these messengers. If people would turn to the Lord, what is going to bring that about? These messengers who personally deliver the message about Jesus Christ. Secondly, the message itself. The message has the power of God for salvation. This is what will produce the faith and convince them. And then thirdly, this international mission that is explaining there in 8 to 20. In the case of Israel, the first two are not enough. The first two aren't going to produce repentance. There's a third that he begins to deal with. And that is God is going to make them jealous by taking his grace and mercy to the other nations. And that is the third means that God is going to use to make his people see their sin and rebellion. Israel is going to look and see the, na- the other nations receiving grace and mercy and blessing. They're going to see the other nations knowing this God that they've rejected. They're going to see how they ought to have responded. And they're going to be jealous. Paul doesn't see the international mission, the taking of the gospel to the Gentiles, as God's rejection of Israel. 
but it's God's ordained means for actually bringing this hard-hearted people to him. Look at there, chapter 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. He doesn't see this as now God's leaving his people behind, but God is sending this gospel to the Gentile nations so that they could see their sin more clearly. And he picks up again in verse 11. I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, their tres- through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. And he'll really expand on this through chapter 11. I don't want you to get distracted with that yet and lose the main point in chapter 10. The main point in chapter 10 is that not all people are going to respond to the gospel. God knows that up front, but it should be proclaimed anyway. It glorifies God to proclaim the gospel even to people that he knows will willfully and rebelliously reject it. It's important we understand that. This mission is not only about saving people. And that's why he ends there in verse 21. Look at this. Just, Just picture this picture. Israel, from the very beginning, rejecting all of God. I mean, they're not even into the promised land and they're already making idols. And he ends this chapter quoting, All day long I've held my hands out in loving entreaty, gracious, merciful entreaty to this very people that are so stubborn and rebellious. Because that is God's nature. That is God's nature to do that. And so the mission must be undertaken. As one writer expresses it, it's a picture of the everlasting arm spread open in unwearied love. Do you get the picture? God's like, I know you, you're going to hate this message and you're going to reject the messenger, but I'm sending my son anyway. And even while you are crucifying him to try and get rid of him, he'll be praying for your salvation and my mercy upon him. This is the burden and beauty of missions. You think about this. The Great Commission, Matthew 28. Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. The resurrected king of the universe arises to the place of all authority in heaven and on earth. He has all power and all authority to do whatever he so wishes. He's the king of the universe. And he issues marching orders to his foot soldiers. And his marching orders are not, go and squash my enemies and defeat them. And show them who I really am. And make them submit. He doesn't send his messengers out with a message of judgment. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It's amazing. The king's mission, after all that we have done, is go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. That's the king we serve. Accept him or reject him. He is extending his grace out to all nations, to a disobedient and contrary people. That's the main point we must get. And when he has the power to do anything he wants, and he gives us that power, the power that raised him from the dead, He doesn't give us the power to annihilate all his enemies. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What does he use and what does he give us his power for? To be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Many will hear and not believe Many will stubbornly reject the gospel, but we must preach it anyway because God is holding out the arms of his love and grace through us. How many of you believed the gospel the first time you heard it? How many of you believed the second time or the third time or the fifth time?
these glorious truths of the gospel are not only supposed to fill our heads with knowledge, but to fill our hearts with passion for Jesus Christ and passion for the lost. Paul could say, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they could be saved. He could say in Romans chapter 9, I wish that I were cu cut off and a curse for the sake of my people. This is what he's trying to convey as he understands God's heart for the nations. This is why he wrote the letter. This is where the letter's going. He's going to make an appeal that Rome, the church at Rome, partner with him to see this gospel taken out to every language and tribe and people and nation. What are you doing with the people around you? What are you doing with the gospel that you've been entrusted with? What are you doing with it? What is distracting you from taking this simple message which we have seen is everyone's only hope of being saved? What are you doing with it? There is nothing more important than for us to be the bearers of this message and God has put you in a sphere where you're the one who has to speak it. No one else will if you don't. And it's not just about evangelism, it's about missions. What are we doing? What are we doing? 40% of the world's people groups are unreached. That means the people that are growing up in those people groups will never hear somebody bringing to them the good news of the gospel even once in their whole lifetime. That's a reality. It is a reality that Christians spend more on dog food than on foreign missions. We spend more on buying decorations for Halloween for our pets, in America anyway, than we do on foreign missions. What is Midrand Chapel doing? Where's all our time and our money going? Is this the burden of our church and the burden of your hearts? I like the way that Oswald Smith said it. The Lord didn't tell us to build beautiful churches, but to evangelize the world. Just this week, I was talking with some of our members about these lights <laughs> and the ceiling that looks like a factory to me. And they dangle on chains, yeah, and I think, surely we could do better than this. You know, decorating the church and making it a place where God is honored. And it does bother me, I'll be honest with you. But what bothers me more is if we had a wonderful looking ceiling with, you know, 500,000 rands worth of lighting and no missionaries that we're sending out. That bothers me much worse. I find it difficult to believe that in a congregation this size, God is not calling any of you to take the gospel to those who've never heard. Those unreached people groups are living in countries they're situated in countries where it is illegal to preach the gospel and where Christians are persecuted. And some of you will have to suffer to take the gospel there. And some of you may even have to die. But Jesus is worthy. Are we a church that's willing to pay that price? Are we a church that's, that's going to put our programs and our decorations and our conferences second to the mission of Jesus Christ? the gospel of the glory of Jesus among the nations. If God is knocking on the door of your hearts or your children's hearts and convicting them that they should give up their careers and their fancy education and their nice cars and live in difficulty in one of these countries for the sake of the gospel, will you release your children with joy? And will we send them with support? And what are you going to do this week? What are you going to do this week with the people around you who need to hear this message? Let's pray. Father, we've got much to repent of. Our sin is great. But our Savior is greater than our sin. Jesus Christ, you are so gracious in holding out your arms and sending us to proclaim this message to disobedient people who reject you time and time again. And yet, Lord, one day when we heard this message, we said, yes, yes, we believe it. One day you turned the lights on 
Father, forgive us for giving up, for not persevering, for getting distracted. Forgive us for a church, as a church, for our lack of mission zeal and our lack of evangelism and our lack of compassion. And Father, as we ask you to forgive us, change us. We've heard your word. We've seen your message. We've been studying this glorious gospel for months and months and months, and we couldn't understand it better except that it would inflame our hearts with passion for Jesus Christ, that nothing else would matter to us but to see him proclaimed, whether people accept it or reject it. Father, please change our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please stay for some fellowship afterwards. Greet someone you don't know. And then at 10.30, productivity, um, getting a bit more practical on how to, to live that out.